Hello, I'm Len Jarvis, contributing editor for Across the Fence with another travel adventure for you. We're going to start here in London and then move on to Belgium with stops in Antwerp, a port since the 11th century. But first, there's a lot to do and see here in London. And let's start with a walk across the Tower Bridge. A brisk walk across the Tower Bridge stretching over the River Thames since 1894 is a great way to start our London visit, and many others seem to agree. It is said that some 200,000 of us cross this bridge every week. From inside the towers, visitors can observe the Victorian engine rooms, learn about the history of the bridge, and get spectacular views from this unique vantage point. The River Thames steals the show. It's England's longest waterway at 215 miles, and there to the left is the Belfast, the first Royal Navy battleship, now a museum. Close by is City Hall and the Shard, the tallest building in the United Kingdom. For me, it looks a little bit out of place. The best way to view the Tower Bridge is from water level. It's the river's only drawbridge designed for cargo ships to enter the Port of London handling some 50 million tons every year. Westminster Abbey, a living church that enshrines the history of a nation, is considered the finest example of early Gothic architecture in existence. Built in the 11th century by King Edward the Confessor, here was the funeral of Princess Diana, the wedding of Kate and William, and the coronation of 38 royal monarchs. The summer of 2013 marked the 60th anniversary of perhaps the most important occasion in 20th century British history, the coronation of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in June of 1953. As a teenager, I watched this historic event on the black and white Sylvania TV set from my family's home in Andover. I have seen Queen Elizabeth twice, at the 1986 Expo in Vancouver and in June of 1980 when she rode past me during London's annual Trooping of the Colour Parade. Even though the slide has faded, the memories are vivid. After Westminster Abbey, I wanted to see Buckingham Palace the official residence of the Queen and the royal family. To find it, all we had to do was follow the mounted guards right to the front gate. It became the royal residence in 1837 during the reign of Queen Victoria, and that's her memorial statue in front. Reigning for almost 67 years, she is surrounded by the angels of justice, truth, and charity. And atop all that is a gilded statue of victory and I love this shot of her waving goodbye to a plane load of tourists. That tall statue of Admiral Horatio Nelson means that we are close to Trafalgar Square, where political marches and rallies are held, and Londoners gather to usher in the new year. The statue honors Admiral Nelson's October 21, 1805 naval victory at Cape Trafalgar off the coast of Spain where his fleet, outnumbered 33 to 27, defeated Napoleon, confirming the supremacy of the British Navy and ensuring that France would never invade Britain. Down by six ships, Nelson shrewdly divided his vessels into two divisions perpendicularly, firing against the larger enemy fleet. The five-hour battle was the most decisive naval victory of the war, with Napoleon losing 22 ships without a single British loss. During the fierce engagement, tragically, Nelson was fatally wounded and died about 30 minutes before the end of the battle. His last words after being informed that victory was intimate were, now I am satisfied. Thank God I have done my duty. The 187-foot Nelson column is flanked by two fountains that were added later to break up open space and limit the potential for demonstrations. Each fountain is adorned with elaborate sculptures of dolphins, mermaids, and mermen. As you can see, they do not have the traditional single tail, 
instead long and powerful ones extending from the legs. Overlooking the square is St. Martin in the Fields, literally standing in the fields when built in 1726. The design was revolutionary for the time and heavily influenced the iconic style of our churches here in New England. But what everyone enjoys most at Trafalgar Square are the four bronze lions said to have been cast from French cannons captured in battle. For those agile enough to climb, they create the perfect photo opportunity. Marco Ayala, the video editor for our show today, was up to the challenge. But why was he carrying all that stuff? You should get the train to get down. According to legend, the lions will come to life if Big Ben chimes 13 times. And with that famous clock there at the end of the street, they would surely hear it. Well, unless something goes wrong, there will be only nine chimes for now. That's a relief. Big Ben is the largest four-faced clock in the world and was heard for the first time on July 11, 1859. It is among the most well-known symbols of London and has appeared in thousands of magazines, movies, and television shows for establishing shots of the city. And recently, the House of Commons officially proclaimed it Elizabeth Tower. In recognition of Her Majesty's 60 years of unbroken public service, on behalf of her country. A sign for Montpelier Street, or as they say here, Montpelier, caught my eye. A good omen, I thought, and decided to check it out to see what I could find. Not far along, I spotted the tea clipper, and with a special on fish and chips, I couldn't resist this British tradition that has been around for 150 years, and in I went. Winston Churchill called them good companions. John Lennon smothered his in ketchup, and Michael Jackson liked his with mushy peas. If they liked mushy peas and ketchup, I decided to go with the works and I'm glad I did. And yes, it was as good as it looks, maybe better. A short ride away is Abbey Road, the name of the 11th and the last album the Beatles recorded, and on the cover, here they are, crossing Abbey Road. And like everyone else who visits, I had to cross this legendary spot in musical history. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! <laughs> and after all, I had seen them on the Ed Sullivan Show back on February 9, 1964, when they made their first visit to the United States. This photo shows the Beatles recording at Abbey Road Studios, where they created nearly all of their albums and songs from 1962 through 1970. It is the world's largest recording studio, and the space can easily accommodate, at the same time, a 110-piece orchestra and 100 singers. But what's all that graffiti, you may ask? Well, it has become tradition for visitors to pay homage to the Beatles by leaving a note on the wall. And this fan did the same, but it's only temporary as the walls are painted over every three months to make way for new messages. Our last day in England was safe for a place that I've always wanted to see, Stonehenge, about a two hour drive from London. Despite being an overcast day with a cold north wind, it is a sight to behold. Built more than 5,000 years ago, it was designed to view the movement of the sun, moon, and stars. Recently, British archaeologist Mike Pearson, after a decade of research, has determined that the area was also an important ancient burial site. People not only came to pay their respects, but would stay on for weeks to help build and maintain Stonehenge. That connection between life, death, and the hereafter was of primary importance to them, and Stonehenge continues to be a spiritual and mystical place. In the morning, we would leave for Belgium, just time for a quick look at the night lights of London.
On our way to Heathrow Airport, we made a quick stop at Harrods to pick up some snacks for our flight to Antwerp. It opened in 1824 and is now the largest department store in Europe. With its five floors, some have even compared it to a museum with something to experience on all levels and around every corner. Despite being very expensive, it's the second most visited place in London. But be warned, don't try to take a picture in their high-end jewelry department. The wonderful smell of fresh baked pastry led me to what I was here for. I'll have that, one of those, the pink one, and to finish the order, a couple of cookies like that little boy is enjoying. In the waiting area at Heathrow, I had to sample and they were good. Also impressive was this airport employee who kept impatient children entertained with arts and crafts while waiting for their flight. What a great idea. In Antwerp, we met up with Scott and Kathy Donnelly, friends from Burlington who would be our traveling companions for the remainder of our adventure. The tulips were just beginning to bloom and the feel of spring and rebirth was in the air. A good omen, we thought. Antwerp is located on the eastern bank of the Scheheldo River, connecting to the North Sea and one of the largest seaports in Europe and a most welcoming tourist-friendly city. But it hasn't always been that way. Legend says the name Antwerp comes from the Dutch handwerpen, meaning hand thrown. And here's why. The story goes that a giant called Antigoon controlled river traffic demanding exorbitant tolls and would cut off the hand of those who refused to pay. But enough was enough and a young soldier named Silvius Barbo killed the giant, cut off his hand and threw it in the river. There was great celebration for the hand thrown in the river, thus the name Antwerp, and this impressive statue of Barbo in front of City Hall. If you look closely, there's water spurting out of the severed hand. A little too realistic, don't you think? Restaurant and shops are abundant in the town square, and at the end of the street is the Central Railway Station. It was designed and built between 1895 and 1905 and is regarded as the finest example of railway architecture in Belgium. If you want to surprise someone back home with flowers, just place an order and any vendor will gladly take care of that for you. Or perhaps they would prefer Belgium chocolates, with a recipe dating back to the 17th century and considered just about the finest in the world. The to die for taste is twofold, ingredients and process. No vegetable shortening is used and only the finest and precise amount of cocoa to create the creamy blends. But most importantly, the process is steeped in family craftsmanship and tradition who continue to maintain a hint of secrecy. On the other hand, if you're looking for a taste of home, just down the street is McDonald's in the shadows of the elegant spires of the Cathedral of Our Lady. It's the tallest church in Belgium, with its 403-foot tower holding a belfry with a 47-foot bell carillion. Inside are some of Peter Paul Rubens' masterpieces, including the raising of the cross and the Assumption. Nearby is his home for 24 years, from 1616 until his death in 1640. It gives us an idea of how he lived and worked. It was not only a studio, but a meeting place for the rich and famous. Unlike many artists, Rubin did very well and used his wealth to support up and coming artists by buying their paintings and letting them study here. In the dining room, you come face to face with the master himself. This self-portrait is rare, just one of four that he ever did, and he always portrayed himself as a distinguished gentleman, never a painter. And with that, we are out of time and I must bid you totzins, goodbye until I see you again.
Lynn Jarvis for Across the Fence in Antwerp, Belgium. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.